2 Peter 3, 8 through 15. <clears throat> but do not forget this one thing, dear friend. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowliness. Instead, is patient with you, not waiting anyone to perish, wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disap disappear with a roar. The elements will, <clears throat> will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed it coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But the keeping with the promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. So be it. So if you didn't realize that I wasn't here last week, I went to a women's walk. If you haven't been, let me see if I can spot some people and give you eye contact. Then maybe you should consider going. And I really enjoy Women's Walk because I'm one of just one, two, maybe three guys with all these women. I have to be honest, so I enjoy that. <laughs> Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, awesome God. The fact that you would love us so violently, so recklessly, whatever the words are that we want to put that we realize that it's a personal love, that you love us so much that you don't want anyone to perish, but that you want all to be saved and reconciled back to you. We just thank you for your love, especially the fact that you would send your son to die for us so that we could be justified and set right with you. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what is the word for? That for? What about F-O-R? What about F-O-R-E? Hmm, you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about it. So you have no idea when I open my mouth and I say something about a but, what I'm talking about either. Look at Mary Ann laughing. So when you're at a women's walk and you make a statement that says, I like big butts, talking about the butts in the Bible, they only hear I like big butts. Let me tell you that. And they let you know it all week long. Got an answer to prayer yesterday. I didn't actually. Sherry did. From somebody at the walk. You never know who you're going to touch. And Sherry got a letter saying how much she touched this particular person. I didn't expect it. I didn't know that it would happen. But we were praying for it. And what an answer to prayer. How God moves. I was asked when I went to the walk, when they prayed over me, they said, what do you want everyone to get out of your talks this weekend? And I said, oh, how he loves us, how much he loves us. Because no matter where you're at in your relationship with Jesus Christ, your relationship with God, when you realize how much he loves you, then everything else in this world is okay. You have the peace that surpasses all understanding. You know how loved you are, and the things of this world just simply don't matter. And that's what we've read about in Acts. And if you didn't notice, I think Marianne might have pointed it out, I heard you spotted it, that the reading had an Acts chapter missing. So you've got to catch it up. <laughs> 
we're starting Hebrews. You've got a new calendar tomorrow. But I did miss an uh, Acts chapter in there. So you should be through with Acts now. For Acts 26, 7, 28. I'll get it right. But I forgot one in there. So you need to catch it up and you start Hebrews um, tomorrow. So everyone should have a calendar of events for the church and should have a calendar of reading and everything. And it is wonderful reading along with it, isn't it, Polly? It is wonderful reading along with it. All of us together doing what we saw the first church did in Acts. Coming together. It's wonderful coming for the movie nights and the potlucks and everything else. And if you miss this week's you missed a chance to laugh and cry because that's a release of emotions that God has given us, the laughter and joy that we can have as Christians rather than walking around like this. I'm a Christian. I've got joy in my heart. We need to show how much we are excited, how much that we feel love so that we can love others. And part of my teaching was that word but, which I meant not as a noun, but as a conjunction. And that word for, which Bob hit it on, it was a preposition is what I meant, not the noun and not the adverb form. And I explained that and I got a little PS in the card to Sherry. Tell Alan that his basic English lesson helps me read the Bible more. Wow, we both got blessed. But I didn't get to read my card first. Uh, yeah, I opened her mail up. <laughs> I never get any mail. The one I get, he opens first. <laughs> so when I said I like big butts, every woman in there heard this. There's a song, if you're not familiar, like Polly mentioned last week about your thongs being flip-flops or something else. It's what your perception is. And this cup, the cup says, I like big cups and I cannot lie. That's because that's a song if you're familiar with it or not. So I kept hearing that song all weekend, Alan likes big butts. And he does know why, because they heard that. Because they are huge in the Bible. I was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. And one of the questions I asked, and I'll ask again right now for you, and I'll direct this one at Bob since he got the preposition right. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. It's a preposition. A preposition ties together something. How many of you can tell me what John 3.15 says? No, well, let's see hands go up. Come on. Because you don't know, but you should. Satan is a deceiver. He wants to deceive us. You've got to know what John 3.15 says to understand John 3.16. You've got to understand those buts to know that I was blind, but now I see. Because this is where I'm at now. I can see. And since my eyes have been opened, I need to tell others so their eyes can be open. And yep, some people are looking at what John 3.15 is. That's fine. So when I said I like big butts, I was trying to get that out there. You're not who you were. You are a new creation in Christ. And look for those little things that can mean so much in the Bible. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you this. Be careful the words you say when you, when you say those things, especially in a room full of women. I heard about it every single day. <laughs> God loves us so much that when we believe in Jesus Christ, all of those buts before, all those doubts that you have, all those reasons why you can't, have been erased. You are a new creation in Christ. You are a child of God. Nothing can separate you. And you can do mighty, wonderful things, including living a life where you tried so hard to do before on your own, and now you just need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him. It's the easiest thing in the world and the hardest thing in the world at the same time to do. 
But all of the work was done by Jesus Christ who gave up heaven, who came and lived and taught us how, and who continued His mission through us. Because see, Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power. You will be my witnesses. So don't hold on to all those reasons and doubts and insecurities you have. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1, In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began. Look for those words. The things that Jesus began. So if he's gone now and we're still here on earth, there is something that needs to be continued, is there not? We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit the apost to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God a continued theme that you see throughout the Gospels, the kingdom of God. Because you don't belong to this kingdom here on earth, you belong to the kingdom of God. You're not in heaven yet, but you are part of the kingdom of God now to bring heaven to earth like an unforeseen kiss so that they can see the hurricane love of God. It will blow them away one way or the other. But if their foundation is Jesus Christ, they'll be like that tree on the shoreline, that palm tree getting blown away by God and just embracing the love that they could never, ever imagine. How could a God love them so much? On one occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Three years of training. Jesus says he's going to leave them, but he says he has to leave them so that they can do greater works than he. And then he tells them, go back to Jerusalem and sit and wait. <laughs> wow. The biggest job ever given to anyone to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to this world and the disciples are told to go and wait. They weren't given a certain amount of time. They weren't told what to do. Just simply go and wait. But see, they knew what to do already. They needed to have one mind. They needed to be unified in prayer. They needed to be relying on God rather than themselves, not looking at their time frame or their power or their might but to be an instrument used by God collectively and individually to continue the work of Jesus in this world. Verse 6, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. You don't need to know anything other than Jesus has called you to be a light to this world. So when you sit down and pray, you say, God, bring me opportunities, give me faith, give me the, the gifts of the Spirit that you want to give me, help me be united with my brother and sister in Christ. When I'm weak, help that brother or sister that has these gifts to strengthen me and help me to strengthen them. Help me not to have any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth, but only words that will build up, that will strengthen the body of Christ so that we can effectively be the hands and feet of Jesus to a lost world. So Jesus continued to say, but you don't need to know any of these things, but here's what you will do. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and, another conjunction, you will receive power and you will be a witness. If you have received the power of God living in you to be a born again child of God and you're not witnessing, then something is wrong. One simple conjunction, this and that. Peanut butter and jelly, whatever you want to think. Holy Spirit and witnessing. That's what you're called to do. <clears throat> These little words, it can mean so, so much. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and, not just Jerusalem, Judea, because you will go out from there. And Samaria, that place you don't want to go. 
and <laughs> all the way to the ends of the earth you will be my hands and feet because of the power of God that resides in you. And you don't have to know how, why, anything else. You just need to go. The power of God residing in you. As Jacob said once before in a talk to some men, Jesus' butts are a lot bigger than all of yours. Don't make excuses. The power of God resides in you. One comment that was said when we were at the walk this weekend talked about the fact that the Washington Monument, you drive by and you see it all lit up, huge, crystal clear because of the amount of lights pointing at it. And we should be like those lights pointing to Jesus. It was a quote, I don't know if it's from him originally or not, but it's in a book written by J.D. Greer. And it's read this way. Have you ever driven into Washington, D.C. on Interstate 395 late at night? If so, you've probably marveled at the brilliance of the Washington Monument illuminate, illuminated against the night sky. Numerous lights costing hundreds of thousands of dollars shine directly on the stone pillar memorializing the father of our country. Hmm, the Father. Yet I doubt you have ever noticed or even thought about it, about those expensive, brilliant lights. They, they are there to illuminate and to direct your attention towards something else. As a new creation in Christ, you are designed, created, born again to shine your light so that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But don't forget we fight a spiritual battle. Satan is always on the prowl seeking whom he may devour. He is the one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So even when you say, I like big butts, <laughs> you can still use those things for God's glory. You can explain what that means. You can teach. And then you can get a letter in the mail that says, P.S. Jerry, tell Alan his basic English structure has done a lot for me reading my Bible. Woo! <laughs> Just to notice those things that we miss otherwise because Satan is trying to deceive us. There's a devotion. Let me see if I can find it that I read that I wanted to share with you. It's from February 10th. It's called The Accuser of the Brethren. The devil is at church as often as you are. He's studying how he may accuse you. He is like those who listen to sermons only to find fault so they can tell, call the minister an offender for some misplaced word or other. You get up here and see if you don't misplace a word, right? It's going to happen. You're going to say that inopportune time I like butts and then I put big butts in there because Nick had already emphasized butt when he was talking so I just thought they automatically would know what I was talking about but see they're not accustomed when I go but you understand it but they didn't so I had to explain it but what an opportunity this goes on to say the apostle knew what sophisticated mind games the devil plays he called them his devices or yours may say schemes. That's from 2 Corinthians 2.11. It means his clever arguments. In order that Satan might not outwit with us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Every day we fight a spiritual battle. And Satan is whispering in your ear. But you can't do this. But you don't have time. But remember all those things you did in your past? But remember those things you still struggle with today. Jesus didn't say any of those things. He said you don't need to know about anything except for this, this but, this complete opposition. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses. <clears throat> John 3.16, I told you, started out with a preposition. 
A preposition is a function word that indicates a purpose, a goal, or recipient. In Webster's 1828 dictionary, if you're familiar with it, because originally our dictionary in English was based on the Bible and the definitions of the word there. It says against in the place of as a substitute or equivalent, noting an equal value or satisfactory compensation, either in barter and sale, in contract or in punishment. And it gives an example. Genesis 48, 7. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for flocks and for the cattle of the herds. That is, according to the original, he gave them bread against horses. In the place of is another definition, noting substitution of persons or agency of one in the place of another with equivalent authority. An attorney is empowered to act for his principal. Will you take a letter and deliver it for me at the post office? That is in my place or for my benefit. It also means in exchange of, noting one thing taken or given in place of another. As to quit the profession of law for that of a clergyman. Another definition is in the place of, instead of, as to translate a poem line for line. And the last definition in the Webster's 1828 says in the character of noting resemblance, a sense derived from substitution or standing in the place of. Like in the Greek, if a man can be fully assured of anything for truth without having examined what is there that he may not embrace for truth. John 3.16 starts with for. Think about the definition I just gave you again of substitution in place of another. John 3.15 says, after Jesus says, I must be lifted up just as the serpent was raised up in Moses' day. Why was that? That's why you need to read your Bible and study. Because the people had been bitten by venomous snakes and they were going to die. So Jesus said in the same way, I am going to be lifted up for you. For you. Because without me coming and substituting my life for yours, you will die eternally separated from God forever and ever and ever. So I am coming, verse 15, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For, tying that statement together, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. See, that for is so big that God could love everyone so much, even enemies of his, because we were all enemies, that he would send his son to die, that if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life instead of eternal death. Those little words that mean so much in the Bible, that blow us away, that tell us just how much God truly loves us. So now I've got another question. What does the Great Commission say? The first word in Matthew 28, 19 is therefore. <laughs> therefore go. Thank you again, Bob. <laughs> Bob's helped me, didn't even know it. Therefore go. <clears throat> That's tying together. Therefore is an adverb that expresses a relationship between words. So let's start in verse 16. Then... That's what the NIV uses, but it's the same word that is also translated but, just so you know. But, or then, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of the eleven now still doubted. We fight a spiritual battle every single day. Satan is trying to cast doubts and insecurities 
on us, saying we cannot do what Jesus said. You don't need to know anything about. If you have the power, use it. You will be my witnesses. Verse 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, These words of peace that surpass all understanding. All authority in heaven, on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus Christ, the one who will lay down his life to, to save you, or did lay down his life at this point to save them. All authority has been given to him, and he is giving us ambassadorship, telling us that we have the power, this, this fact that we can go and make disciples thereof, that we will be his witnesses. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And many forget this part. There's a conjunction next. And, because many people quote just that previous verse, verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. Because God is a holy, righteous God, and He expects His people to be holy and righteous sanctified and set apart for His purpose. Bought again by the blood of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Spirit, set apart as royal priests and a royal priesthood to bring light to this world. Then there's still more of that Great Commission. These are still in the quotation marks right there. And, another conjunction, don't fear, don't doubt, because surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Oh, the comfort that Jesus says. I know this mission that I'm sending you on is beyond your scopes of imagination, how you can do this. But in our weakness, He is made strong, isn't He? We have no excuses whatsoever for not being a light to this world, for not praying, for not, not trusting God to save our families, to save our friends, to make a difference in this world. Like I said, that letter coming was so wonderful to see that, to get that little encouragement. And you know what? You might not ever get a letter. You might not in this world. But you're still called to be faithful. You're still called to be a light. You're still called to work and press towards that mark to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. <clears throat> Nick said, he posted a video, he was the other pastor that was there, he took a Uncle Sam's picture and just said, Jesus just wants you. Because he got that out of this week, out of my talking, not bragging about that. But he got that out of the love. The love that Jesus has, that's all he wants. He doesn't care about anything else. He doesn't care about your insecurities, anything you've done, any of your failures in the future, anything else. He just wants a personal relationship with you. And God loved you so much that He didn't want anyone to perish, but instead He sent His Son to die for you so that you could live. To have abundant life here and now and eternal life with Him I told him that my motto verse was Hebrews 11, 7 also, which you guys should know that by now. Hebrews 11, 1 starts out with what faith is. It's that complete confidence in what we cannot see. Because see, all the things that we see make us lose confidence. But faith is having complete confidence in God and the finished work of Jesus Christ and God's love for us. And then he goes on in verse 6 to say, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then the first one in that list is Noah, who by faith, out of holy fear, not knowing of anything about building an ark, he built an ark to save his family. And I build my life upon that. That ark is Jesus Christ, Him crucified. And I do my best to not have any other stumbling block to someone other than Jesus Christ. Do I fail at it? Every day. 
that means tomorrow I will, any day that ends in Y I will, but I know that he loves me and I know that he gives me the power as I die to myself to live for him so that I will hear, well done my good and faithful servant and so that I'll hear the laughter of my children and grandchildren because they've entered that ark which is Jesus Christ. In John 6, starting in verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd, and in your lifetime you will have encountered great crowds, many people that you can be a light to, that you can witness to. He looked up and saw a great crowd toward, coming towards him, and he said to Philip, just one person, one disciple, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He wasn't talking about money, was he? He was talking about buying bread from the one who is the bread of life. He asked this only to test him, verse 6, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. As um, Ken Davis said in the video, Wrong answer. That's an inside joke. If you had not seen it, I've got a few more copies. Because many times he would say to his wife something and it would be wrong answer. Those guys have already been there. That's one of the things that I tried to teach the ladies too. I said, men are clueless. <laughs> and we are. Look, shaking her head. Even this week I've been clueless, right? <laughs> Even after saying it, I can say these things, but I still struggle with doing them. <clears throat> Another of his disciples, Andrew, and whenever you read about Andrew, he's one of my heroes again. He's always bringing someone to Jesus. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, that means he's got to take backstage to him too, right? He spoke up. He said, here is an insignificant, I'm putting that word in, little child, a boy, that the world would say there's nothing he can have to offer. He had five small barley loaves and two small fish. What's the next word? But how far will this go among so many? There's a but, and watch what Jesus does with it. Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were seated as much as they wanted. They had their fill. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing, nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled them in twelve baskets with, pieces, with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Childlike faith is all you need to have. You don't need to be someone that's great. Jesus can use you in your weakness. And if you feed on Him, there will be so many leftovers <laughs> you won't know what to do with. Whatever comes in this life, use it for God's glory. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 15 was our verse that Merle read this morning. Verse 8 starts with a but. So you can see what it says before. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. Because see, what comes before is the judgment that comes upon those that don't know Jesus Christ. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Maybe John 3.15 means a little more to you now but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, let me tell you, he says, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and 
Speed is coming. We talked about that in Bible study the other day. We don't know when it is. Some, some of these older men, some of them, Merle, <laughs> read all these things about end times and well, this and that. Well, you know what? If you want it to hurry up and get here, start telling people about Jesus. Because when that last person saved, we're going to glory, guys. That day will bring about the destruction of the heaven by fire and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patient means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul, who we just finished up about in Acts, because the last part of Acts seems to be about the story of Paul, about the same things that he also wrote to you with the wisdom that, that God gave him. So you're going to read in Hebrew starting tomorrow. That's not one of Paul's letters. But it's written by one of his acquaintances, whoever it may be. I like to think Barnabas again, but it's just like what I like to think because I want Barnabas to have a book because he was encouraging. And Hebrews is encouraging to me to know all of that in the past of the, the, through the Old Testament and everything else to the future, to know that if we fix our eyes on Jesus, that everything will be all right. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your love, that you do not want anyone to perish, but all men to come to you. Lord, help us to have repentant at hearts where we change our mind about the things that are keeping us from serving you with the power, resurrecting power of Jesus Christ that lives inside of us. We thank you that the Spirit seals us where we can cry out, Abba, Father. And we thank you that Jesus is sitting beside of you pleading our case as an advocate for us also. We just thank you and praise you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.